hey, you want to get really strong at the bench press, deadlift, and the squat? We're giving away free access to MAPS Powerlift to one lucky person. All you got to do is leave a comment in the first 24 hours, and if we pick your comment, if we like your comment as the best one of all the comments, you'll get free access to MAPS Powerlift. Now, also, subscribe to this channel, and this is very important, turn on your notifications so you know when we post these episodes because you got to get in in the first 24 hours in order to win free stuff. And for those of you guys and girls that win free stuff, you got to have your notifications turned on. Otherwise, you won't know if you won or not. you got to do that. Turn on your notifications. Uh, also, um, we are running a big promotion. Maps Aesthetic is 50% off, and our Extreme Fitness Bundle is 50% off. So both half off. You can find out more or just sign up at mapsfitnessproducts.com. Just use the code May special with no space for that discount. All right, enjoy the podcast. I have something to talk about. All right, I have a bone to pick with you guys. Whoa, yeah, this is well, not another bone. No, wow. I mean, <laughs> Sal might have to sit this one out. So, Justin, I'm gonna need you to help. <laughs> help, help. <laughs> let's let, are we highlighting strengths? Let, again? Hey, yeah, let's yeah, let's talk about uh, getting the biggest bench in the in the gym. Oh, how, to, how to improve man. your bench? Or oh, how to get true. the strongest bench? Dude, entry. this was this was like the test of strength <laughs> when we were growing up. The, it was the standard. No, nope. it was like the I gold. Mean, standard. It's like nothing else matters. I mean, yeah. it's still, it still, it still kind of is. Uh, not as much. Not as much. And thank, thank you, CrossFit. Right. I mean, I appreciate the the squatting, the overhead pressing, and deadlifting that they brought yeah. back. Brought back. So there is there is a lot more PR talk around squatting and deadlifting than there ever was. You know, yeah, they're not big benchers, are they? Those CrossFitters. No, no not at no, all. No. Yeah. But but back no. in the day, I don't think there's any. Is there's no bench programming in CrossFit? Is there? Uh, Push ups. They yeah. just do emoms or whatever. Yeah. And whatever the hell that means. No. <laughs> I'm your new emom. Every minute on the minute. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, you know, when, when we were younger, if you were like, if you were talking with a group of guys, right? Let's yeah. say I just met you guys. I'm like, hey, what's up? Oh, you look like you work out. Yeah. How do you bench? Do you How bench? much do you bench? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nobody gives a sh would give a shit about deadlift or squat. In fact, nobody ever asked me that until like maybe seven years ago. Yeah, I agree. Nobody ever asked me about any of the lift except for the bench I press. Agree. I mean, some of those say it, it is the squat of the upper body, right? Isn't it? I mean, that's debatable, right? I know they say that or the overhead press yeah. is, is arguably the, mm -hmm. the squat of the upper body. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, if you think about it, you're, you're obviously pressing with your arms like There's you are with the legs. a lot involved, for when, sure. Yeah. Well, it's it's a, you know, I, I train so different today than, you know, what I train like as a trainer or obviously what I train like when I was competing, um, I'm starting to notice that I say competing as much as Sal says purple, but I got to watch that. <laughs> you say it more than I do. I'll start tallying it up. I know. Yeah. Is, yeah. By the way, do you guys well, know I had a purple belt? Yeah. I did. So, uh, oh, I, don't, I'm, I apologize, but I feel like it's. I have to reference that time because it was such an anomaly as far as like the volume of training that I was doing. So, mm -hmm. But today... Uh, you know, bench press many times. I just did this this weekend. Uh, all I did this weekend, uh, training wise, over the, or I should say, over the last four days that we didn't see each other, uh, was uh, bench and squat. Mm -hmm. You know, I literally did that twice, and uh, you know, two and a half different different workouts, and that's all I focus on. And what's beautiful about doing that upper body exercise like that, a, a good barbell bench press, you get some shoulder work involved, you get great tricep work involved, obviously the chest. Mm -hmm. And so you can get a lot of development from one great movement. So getting really strong in the bench press has tremendous yeah. carryover to other it, other muscles. It even, it even works, a lot of people don't realize this, you even strengthen from an isometric standpoint mm -hmm. your, back. your back. Yeah, yeah. This is actually- yeah, yeah, The lats having to stabilize everything. Yeah. They do. And now back in the day, bench press wasn't really an exercise because the original exercise equipment the benches didn't have a rack. So the way that lifters would lift is clean they'd have it. to clean a weight, yeah. go down and bench. And so you were very limited as to how much you can lift. Yeah. Then they invented the rack. And then, of course, bodybuilders started presenting themselves with these really massive pecs. And it became a popular uh, exercise. And it became a test of strength. But it, because it was so popular when I was younger, I focused a lot of time and energy on it. In fact, I would say uh, up until I was in my 30s, it was the exercise I was most concerned with in terms of how strong I was just because I was conditioned mm -hmm. as a kid. I didn't really focus on trying to get super strong in anything else, I was the especially worst in my 20s. Well, and much like anything else, when a girl points something out like, oh, wow, you have a really big developed chest or whatever, that mm -hmm. was like, okay, I'm going to do this forever. Yeah. Like, this is my new thing, <laughs> you know? So I got all into bench pressing mainly because of that. That was the spark. Yeah, and I, you know, and of course, because of that, I think we've all made a lot of mistakes uh, around oh, the absolutely. bench press. Um, I 
I mean, I could recall one where I was I work out with too much weight. In fact, there's one story in particular where I was working out with too much weight and didn't put collars on. Uh, I was a kid. Yeah, this one, was at the YMCA. One side dumps. One side. It started. School. It's like, no, who it's, hasn't done that though? I mean, I've done that, dude. I was like ah, shaking, and then one side started to slide, mm-hmm. and then because I'm fatigued, as it slides, of course, the weight gets down the lever, so it starts to get heavier. Yeah. And then as soon as it came off, fling, and it just right into the window. And now here's one everything. for like the at home workout thing. Back when they had those sand filled weights, and yes. you know, so I. And I had like buckets and things that I would hang off of the sides. Like I had to get inventive to add more weight. And and I was by myself and I and I decided to bench and I'm like, I'm really, you know, I was comfortable benching. I had been doing it for a while, but uh, I had loaded, I would try to max out because I thought every work I had to max out. And like the <laughs> last one, I'm like, I have to really grind my way through it. I got stuck, you know, and then there was nobody to help me. And I went down to my chest all the way. And I, and I was like, what do I do? What do I do? <laughs> ah. and, and so I had to actually like roll it back you went wait hold on you rolled it I back. Rolled back i didn't go forward over which you gotta go this way not was this stu- way again i was a kid like oh, wow. i was He's thinking about his smart. pee-pee. You know yeah what I'm exactly i don't want to crush you're going there. He's i want to crush like, the, like, the, uh, I'll the I'll goods go, yeah, I'll go yeah. over my neck like, but not my nuts <laughs> uh, yeah. the nose was a little uh, problematic but yeah it, it was bad yeah because i've done it many times where I pu- i'm stuck and then i have to roll it down and then you sit up with the weight and do the whole thing but uh-huh. i never i've never brought it to my neck that's very scary that was dumb i had so it was i had the worst bench ever so i mean imagine like in high school right i was 135 pounds and this lanky six foot tall kid yeah big bird totally right that's what mm-hmm. I, that's what i looked like and uh, i used to have to and i think i think i told this a long time ago on the, the podcast uh, i used to have to have a buddy who would stand behind me right for where the where the, where the barbell is at right on the bench and his job was to uh, hold my shoulders down in place oh, yeah. and then the other two guys then there was two guys on the outside spotting each side of the bar and then i and i literally could like only do the bar like i could not wow. i was that weak it's i remember it was such an accomplishment to get to the wheels like mm-hmm. 45 oh the big plates yeah, yeah that, that, was, was, that was a big day that was a big milestone again it came in like my 20s dude <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? like most kids most guys get to that like in their early teens like it came for me like when i was 20. that's how bad my bench was but for the longest time though i didn't I didn't understand the mechanics of, of the bench, right? Like understand like exactly what was going on. When you when you see it, you just see someone lay down and they just you, they just push the bar off the chest. It's it's, it's yeah. uh, very technical. Yes, it's actually one of the more technical exercises, but it doesn't seem like that's it's right. very technical. That's mm-hmm. right. It mm-hmm. looks so basic mm-hmm. when you look at someone else do it, and if you don't have an, an eye for biomechanics. You go like, oh, okay, I get it. I just push the bar up off of me. Yep, I yep. wonder too, like, because I see a lot of guys, and when I'm able to go back into the gym setting, just using machines and these pec decks and all these, and and I don't see a lot of people using the actual like benches, benches, and, and do it. And I, I would be curious to see like some of the technique if they were to then jump over there and see how many guys would have a real problem because it is a skill. It's something you yeah. have to acquire. There's a lot of there was even a lot of misinformation. Even today, there's a lot of misinformation around the bench press. Like, I remember people saying you should not have an arch uh, when you bench press uh, but that's in fact what you're supposed to have I, I when you bench press I everybody's per- like no oh, keep your back flat which is actually terrible advice I mean I right. I perpetuated that myth for a long time as a trainer mm. Um, you know, because all of our certifications, when we would go through them and they talk bench technique, neutral back, that's right. Everything they neutral back, flat back. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like an idiot, I was telling, I had clients putting their feet up on the bench. I had clients telling them to press their back flat, like total terrible. But again, this is early years as a trainer. I don't really, I'm still learning biomechanics. I'm really, I really am not there yet on understanding mechanically how the chest works like you're when i at 20 years old i've got the basic certification at this point at this point and i have my experience that's like that's the, the 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 all of my knowledge and so i don't fully grasp like the position your shoulder girl needs to be in why the arch is good and supports yeah. like i, I didn't think understand it, that as long as it's within reason because this can get extreme as well but as long as it's within reason the best people to look for for bench uh advice and technique are power lifters yeah um, and mainly because power lifters, obviously their goal is to move as much weight as possible. And it definitely can get a little extreme, okay? But if we're talking about raw benching, meaning there's no bench shirt, there's no assistance, I'm just, you know, my t-shirt, I get down and I'm doing my press, they have to maximize leverage and technique to prevent injury and lift uh, as much as possible. Generate so they, the most amount of force possible. Right, in a safe way, right? Yeah. Because they're lifting so much weight. So those are the people you typically want to look at 
when you're looking at uh, advice in you know technique and whatnot when it comes to bench press. And one of the first things that you'll that you'll notice is that there's a heavy emphasis on posture mm -hmm. uh, for proper bench. Um, poor posture will take away your biomechanical advantage uh, right away uh, when you bench. Now, there's one thing that I will challenge about that that is that I think is not true, and this is and this is to credit I think bodybuilders do a better job here is. If you watch a power lifter lift, he's lifting for power. And so he trains in the one, one, one most of the time. It's, it is about getting the most weight up, which getting good at getting the most weight up. Okay. If you're a young kid who wants to have a great chest and, and have a strong bench, uh, is okay. But if you are really looking to develop the chest, then learning to train with other tempos is extremely important. And so that was where I saw, I, I may not have had my, uh, best bench as far as the amount of weight I was putting up, but the best development in my chest came from understanding the importance of yeah. manipulating tempos. And if you watch just power lifters, yeah, because we're going to talk about how to lift the most weight, but I think we'll also talk about hypertrophy, which you know contributes to lifting the most uh, weight. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I think you, and I think that's important because most most kids or young guys that are wanting to get a big bench, they're wanting to get a bench because they actually want a big chest, right? Yeah. It's like. Because at the end of the day, if I told you, hey, you, I could give you an Arnold chest, but you only bench 185, uh, would you rather have that or would you rather have a bird chest and be able to bench 300? What do you really care about? I would guess that most guys would say, I'd want the developed chest. That's really what yeah, I'm going Yeah, and I I'm think, too, the, in terms of like the power lifter's technique and, and maximizing leverage, you could utilize that, but also do it in a bodybuilder yes. type of a setting where That's you right. man manipulate the tempo and really work on that mind-muscle connection of like feeling your way through it. But uh, definitely, there's lots of value in understanding why they set themselves up the way right. they do. To so, me, that, that's where my best bench came from. So when I finally, I, I took my like bodybuilding type style of training and and then figured out the mechanics of a chest press, then saw power lifters and how they created leverage, married the two of them together. That's it. That gave me the the, yeah. the, the best chest that I it's ever developed. Recipe. Right. So let's go back to posture, right? So why is posture something that's so important that you need to work on in order to have a, a good bench press? Well, I think number one you know the technique of benching to really to really maximize leverage means you need to also, you actually need to have a strong stable upper and mid back mm -hmm. because you're anchoring your your shoulder girdle you're pulling your shoulders down and back and you're holding them in position while pressing up and now why is this important well number 1 if the shoulder blades roll forward as you press especially if you're pressing a lot of weight it does place your shoulder in a, a more risky uh, position and so it, and it reduces leverage when you keep the shoulder blades pinned back and anchored and strong and tight which requires good strong upper mid back muscles mm -hmm. now you have more leverage and you can activate the pecs more so it's both it's good for both hypertrophy and for strength well i find posture to me and i'm glad it's the first point that we're bringing up i think is the most important thing when i think back to the clients i trained this was a uh, one of those major hurdles or you know pivotal moments as a trainer for me was I remember scratching my head for at least a year, you know, which you know would be you know hundreds of training sessions, right? That I trained these clients, uh, teaching the bench press, and just man failing and getting my clients to feel it in their chest again, not understanding biomechanics very well and the importance of posture, and the bench press is in in direct conflict with. Uh, your uh your, your your most common postural deviations right so what i mean by that is most people have this rounded shoulders forward head almost everybody does yep. really i mean everybody's got it it's a matter of how excessive or how bad it is so if you already have forward shoulders and forward head and then you go to do something that's pressing forward what's going to take over are your your delts and your triceps in that movement but what we know in order to activate and really work the chest, you need to be in that retracted position, right? We need mm -hmm. to be able to roll the shoulders back and down and lock them into a position, right? Stabilize with the mid back, like you were saying, in order to press with the chest. And if you don't address that first, you're going to have a hell of a time teaching someone how to bench. Yeah, if you if you can, if you bench a lot, you should also be able to row a lot with mm -hmm. good uh, with good form. In fact, I've seen people's bench press go up because they've strengthened uh, their rows because they can anchor themselves. Yes, I mean you need to be able to anchor yourself into the bench in order to, to support. Well, yourself. that was the thing. It's like first of all, you want to have the safety of like safely being able to distribute that force throughout your body, and then you know have that escape. So it has a way that you're protecting those joints that are most susceptible. So not 
know, I have to like build this protective sort of uh, tightening of the muscles around those joints. But then also it, you look at it, a performance loss, like you, you get a leak of performance uh, when there's any inkling of instability or mm -hmm. any, any bit where, you know, your body is not purely anchored to where you have like some type of movement that at any moment, like maybe, maybe the bar moves, travels a little faster one side versus the other. And, you know, now we have to compensate. So the body's got to compensate yeah. and work extra hard to just make yeah. this. And, and, you know, we'll get into technique and all that stuff, yeah. but if you have bad posture to begin with, it's going to be very hard to bench with optimal technique. I, I think we all do. I mean, even trainers. I, I would like to think that we have better posture than the average person. And I, I would tell you- we spend you, way more time in this forward position. Yeah. And Okay, so and I don't know about you guys, but uh, when I think of the two exercises that are, that are most benefited by my priming work that I do, squat and bench press are one and two. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Like if I neglect to prime before I squat or neglect to prime before I bench, it is noticeably different. I mean, noticeably. I, I'm way weaker or I my shoulder hurts. I'm just, you notice a huge You're effort. combating repetitive patterns That's throughout right. your day, all day long. Yeah, you know what's funny is uh, bench press is where I figured out priming before any other exercise. Yeah. In fact, before priming became a thing, back in the day, you would see guys actually, without realizing... They would be priming. And you know what they would do? There's two things that guys would do. Either one, they'd get under the bar like they're going to bench, and they do some body rows. You ever see this? You see this all the time. Mm -hmm. They'd do body rows before they would bench, and they'd say, oh, it helps me bench more. Or you'd see guys who are actually a little bit more you know, in the know would actually do some rows mm -hmm. next to the bench before they do their bench press. You know what's funny about that? It just reminded me when uh, I used to get made fun of a lot because it was just something like uh, uh, naturally just I would do before I would I would bench heavy. I would like kind of take my arms, I'd grip and make a tight fist, and then I would do this and like, ah, oh, like, yeah. like, like a total dynamic uh, type of a warm-up before that. Not just because I knew it, it just helped me kind of get in good position, mm -hmm. but my friend would always, he called it like chicken and winging or something like before it and would make fun of me and I'm like eh, you know it works for me but yeah. it, it it it's along that same kind of a thought process and of course now like proper priming I've learned how to you know set myself up better with that yeah so like if you have issues with your bench press what you might want to do in your routine is just place a focus on strengthening the muscles that give you better posture um, and then oftentimes you'll notice an improvement in your bench press just from doing that. Well, and that brings me to the next point that I think is so important, which is the frequency of it, right? And oh, that, yeah. and when we talk about priming, especially when you're you're priming to combat a postural deviation, frequency is so important. Like if you recognize that you have forward shoulder, you, then you priming your mid back and getting yourself in that neutral or more optimal position. You you can't you can't do enough of it. I mean, mm -hmm. you should be yeah. trying to do it all the time and frequently getting yourself in that better posture so that when you do go to bed. Yeah. Well, speaking of frequency, this was a big uh, eye opener for me back in the day. Was uh, you know because when we were you know working out as kids, we got our information from bodybuilding magazines, and all of them promoted this kind of hit each body part once a week body part split types workout. Right. Mm -hmm. So. Monday would be chest and Tuesday would be back and then shoulders and so on. And we were told, hit it hard, leave it alone, let it rest and recover, rebuild, and then hit it again a week later and you'll be bigger, stronger, and you know have better performance. So I thought that's it. That's it. Like, I never want to work out my body parts more than that because I don't want to overtrain them or it's not going to allow them to grow and whatever. And I remember managing this, this gym once. I've told this story so many times. This guy worked for me and I would notice that, first off, this guy was very muscular. He was a trainer. And I noticed in between clients, he would walk over to the bench, he'd load it up and do, you know, five or six reps with some heavy weight. But for him, it seemed like it was moderate. It didn't seem like it was too heavy. And he would do this throughout the whole day. And then when he would do his workout and push himself, this guy had a tremendous bench press. And I remember asking him, like, why are you, like, are you just bored? Like, why are you doing it? He goes, oh, no. He goes, when I practice often, he goes, I get really, really strong at the mm -hmm. lifts. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking like, that's so opposite from what I've always learned, but I saw how effective it was for him. And then that led me to research Olympic lifters yeah. and Olympic lifters train very frequently. Now what they do is they modify the intensity. See, this is the key. He didn't go out and bench every day heavy. He went out and practiced very often and he benched heavy, I don't know, once a week. Mm -hmm. And so I practiced this and this is the first time in my life that I was able to bench press over 300 pounds. I was stuck forever at whatever it was, 
Then I started increasing my bench frequency where I was bench pressing three days a week or more. Maybe one of them was hard, but the other days were relatively easy where I'm practicing on form or whatever. Some days were low reps, some days were higher reps. But when I bumped the frequency, my strength went through the roof. Yeah, it was interesting. That's when I really started to kind of peer into and understand more of how the central nervous system works. And uh, the, it made so much sense that uh, just if I think about sports and how to get better at certain movements and, mm -hmm. and certain things, I have to practice them all the time. And I have to do them not necessarily at full blast. Like I want to do them just so I'm perfecting each part of the yes. movement. Um, and I had never applied that to working out. But once I started to understand that, it made a massive difference in my strength. Well, this is when I, I really started to learn about how power lifters and Olympic lifters train. Like up until this point, uh, I was really kind of a, a, a oblivious, a, a, a oblivious to that. I had no idea what they were doing mm -hmm. to to get this strong, and I assumed that they were maxing out all the time. That's yeah. how they got there. Yeah. And then I remember meeting somebody that was a power lifter and seeing his programming and realizing like, dude, this dude doesn't lift heavy at all. Yeah. I'm like, I can do that. Yeah. So. I'm. I like when I watched his workouts. Yeah. Many times he was working out with weight. That was lighter than what I could press. Yet he was just bench pressing all the time. That's right. But then when he would go to a meet, he would lift two, three times what I could lift. And it was like, I'm scratching my head going like, this doesn't make sense to me. Mm -hmm. But in order to lift bench, you know, three times a week, you can't be lifting 80 plus percent of your max load every single time or else you do so much damage. Your body's constantly trying to repair. That was the first time that kind of light bulb went off for me about frequency when I saw that and realized how strong they were it was a huge game. Yeah. And then you had like the, 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 the popular powerlifting clubs, like the West side barbell club and so mm -hmm. on. I think they, the way that they would organize it, they had like a dynamic uh, day and then like a, a max effort day was something like that where the dynamic day you had lighter weight and you would lift for speed then you had the heavy day where you're grinding out as much as you can lift mm -hmm. uh, so frequency is huge and by the way this works for any lift so with yeah. any lift you want to increase in weight practice it more often you will be surprised you actually you'll be sh if you've never done this before it'll shock you at how effective it is at improving your strength you just had a you have to modify the intensity you're not going super hard each time mm -hmm. you're practicing maybe one of those days a week you're going kind of hard well, especially with the compound lifts yeah that's where this really makes a big difference there, there's it's uh there's so much detail in a compound lift and it, i mean you guys have uh, know this for sure like how many times have you done a bench a squat any of these compound lifts and you're just slightly off mm -hmm. you're just slightly it's it's like swinging a bat or a golf club like it's when you're when you're mechanics are just and the way you get good mechanics at swinging a golf club or a bat is you practice and you do it all the time. You don't swing yeah. it. It as makes hard. its way into your subconscious. That's right. You get so good at it. And then there's those times when you're fully rested, you're fully fed, you've been consistent with your lifting, and then you go hit that thing and you can you're twice as strong and the ball goes twice as you're far. right. Mm -hmm. You're right because you have the central nervous system adapting, and the way it's adapting is because of the frequent practice. Your body's getting really good at that movement. And by the way, this makes a huge huge difference. You could have somebody who's got massive pecs and shoulders and triceps that by themselves are very, very strong. But if they never practice the bench press, they're not going to be able to do nearly as much as they could if they practiced just that lift. So that's that, there's that central nervous system adaptation that gets you good at the skill of that particular lift. In other words, the muscles are firing in unison. You've got your technique. You're feeling very stable. Your body feels safe. Therefore, it outputs more juice to get you to lift more weight. But then you also have the muscle building effects. And, and here's what ends up happening, especially for natural lifters. When you work out, you get this spike in muscle protein synthesis that lasts for about 24 to 48 hours in some advanced lifters, maybe as long as 72 hours. But after that, it dips down quickly. And it doesn't matter if you're still recovering. So here's the thing, like recovery and adaptation can be two separate things. So you can still be sore four or five days later, but that muscle building signal's gone. It was gone two days ago. So what the frequent lifting does is it maintains this kind of high muscle building signal throughout the week. And you can do this even with a moderate intensity. Even light intensity somewhat sends a muscle building signal. Maybe not as loud as a heavy signal, uh, but it's still there. So the frequency just benefits all of these things. By the way, studies support this. You'll see when they'll control for volume. Um, in other words, same volume throughout the week, but one group worked out three days a week, uh, each body part, other group did it once a week. The three day a week tends to perform better, both in strength and in muscle. So if you only bench once a week and you want your bench press to go up, sometimes just benching twice a week, again, modify the intensity, right? So it's not hard each time. 
just doing that alone, oftentimes you'll see an increase in your bench press. And by the way, you, t- you tend to see it within the first week. This is the f- crazy thing. You'll see it within like one or two weeks. Um, and that's what happened to me. The first time I benched, you know, three days a week, it was like by the third time I felt stronger. And I was like, what the hell is going on? This yeah. is this is absolutely insane. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, the next one, this one's actually quite important. I don't learn this one till, till later on, but all compound lifts, all the big lifts, they all have another lift that tends to have a lot of carryover to it, right? So like, uh-huh. uh, for example, um, if, uh, if my squat goes up, my deadlift usually goes up. It's like so much carryover from my squat to my deadlift, right? So if, if I want my deadlift to go up, if I just work on my squat, it tends to boost it as well. Where there is a lift for the bench press that's got a tremendous amount of carryover, and that's the overhead press. Mm-hmm. If your overhead press goes up 50 pounds, you can pretty much bet that you're going to see a pretty decent increase in your bench press. So if you're not practicing getting strong at the overhead press, you're probably missing out on that bench now, press. Now, I didn't... I didn't see this until I actually got into um, full range of motion overhead pressing. Mm. So I, I, for the longest time, I did the you know the bodybuilder shoulder press, mm. sitting down in the mati- mil- military press, and you know the shortened reps, only going down to ninety degrees. Oh yeah, you got to go all the way down. Yeah, right? and I just didn't. So was the lockout the the hard part for you when you went to bench? Uh, yeah, you know I don't I don't remember what was like the hardest the whole part of the bench. Yeah, press well consider this, difficult. Justin. That it's you're not you're not only are you not going all the way down, but you're not going all the way oh, up. Oh right. Yeah. yeah so you're not I mean. you're not it's either one. Yeah. So I mean either the whole one. and what my point of bringing this up or telling the story is that I was doing overhead press for a long time and and I didn't feel the carryover. But the reason why I didn't was because I was, you know, overhead pressing or shoulder pressing, military pressing like a bodybuilder. This mm-hmm. whole time under tension, stopping at 90 degrees, keeping a slight bend in the elbows, not locking out, coming down to 90 degrees, getting this massive pump on my delts. But then I go to do shoulder stuff, not, I mean, go to do bench press, don't really see a big difference. It wasn't until I started to do a full range of motion yeah. shoulder press and full lockout extension and stabilize the top mm-hmm. did I really feel the carryover in that. And that wasn't until way later on in my career. Yeah. If yeah, you, you show sense. me a guy with a good bench, a guy or a girl with a good bench press, you typically have someone with a pretty damn good uh, overhead press. It's just one of those exercises that, and that's the thing. Sometimes you're stuck in your bench mm-hmm. and it's hard to work it out with your bench. So sometimes it's like, okay, I'm going to keep doing my normal bench stuff. I can't figure out how to get that to go up. Let me see if I can make my overhead press go up instead. And then that, and then that'll give me that carry. Well, and you think about that too, how much more, uh, that, that puts pressure on you being able to stabilize your, your shoulder joint in itself, uh, uh, more emphasis on that. And so I could see like how that would translate really well and the range of motion point, which you brought up, uh, you know, but also like taking those different degrees and, and angles of pressing. Uh, so like even like an incline bench, you know, yeah. it's got value. So it's like it's this whole uh, uh, gradual, uh, you know, uh, different angles of, of force that, that you account for uh, with your shoulders and chest. Yeah, well, it helped me. It helped me dig out the bottom big time. Right. Because yeah. when you think about when you're when you're on a on a deep bench press. I mean, and you're pulling, and those shoulders are rolled all the way back. Those, those triceps, that upper back, also how stable your core has to be to use that to push yourself out. Right. When you when you bench like how I used to bench as a kid, which was only coming down to ninety degrees, I could have this flimsy core mm-hmm. and bench the same amount. I could have my feet up on the bench and basically bench the same amount. I didn't have to brace very much. Mm-hmm. Because uh, it was all here. It was all in this 90 degrees coming down and pressing up. I wasn't getting my entire body involved. The overhead press, a full range of motion standing overhead press, taught me to connect everything. That is what carried over into that like better bench. Yeah, which brings us to the next point, which I think is connected to this, which is uh, improving your shoulder mobility and stability. Mm-hmm. This one I figured out uh, relatively early on just because I saw an ad in a bodybuilding magazine for something called a shoulder horn. And it was just this, this plastic thing that you went over your shoulders and you did rotator cuff exercises. And I mimicked the exercise at the gym. And I couldn't, I couldn't believe that I added, I added five pounds of my bench press almost right away just from doing that. Now, now people think, well, why does that help? Well, here's why. Your body will not allow you to, to, to put out as much strength as it, as it can if it thinks it's going to get hurt. Mm-hmm. Your body just won't do that. And if your shoulders are not stable – 
And you might be able to lift another 20 pounds, but your body's not going to let you push 20 more pounds because things aren't feeling very stable. I had the same sort of epiphany, uh, mainly on the rotational end of it. So uh, I, I hit a wall. I would always get to a good amount of weight on bench, but then my shoulder was the limiting factor where I would start to get pain or there'd be you know some kind of an impingement that inevitably would occur. And so I started to get into more unconventional type of tools. And uh, I, I researched and found these Indian clubs and started out with lightweight. So it was like one pound, but really just taking it through the, all those ranges of motion that the shoulder joint is capable of and, and really like reteaching it to uh, be able to respond properly helped that added element of stability that, that was lacking in my shoulder joint. I didn't even realize was lacking. And then I started to kind of load it and you can strengthen those muscles just just like the rest. Totally. Well, one of my favorite, uh, and I, I think I did this on my Instagram uh, probably like six months ago, which is the suspension trainer warm up where you do W's mm -hmm. and you, and it's basically like your shoehorn type exercise. Yeah. Where I'm using my my D body weight. That are rubber bands. Yeah. Those are yeah. Great. It is, and to me, it was, uh, was very logical, right? Like that, that this would make a big difference. You figure the the you know the humerus goes in. You have this ball and socket joint, right? That's the shoulder, right? So it's like floating. And if you don't wake up all the muscles that are supporting and stabilizing that floating joint, then what do you expect when you load it, you know, and you go to press? I mean, it's not going to be going to get off track. It's going to get off track. It's going to float around. It's going to move around. It's going to be unstable. And that means that's that's energy that you're going to lose in that area right there and a major area that's taking on a lot of direct force. So waking that up and stabilizing that really good. You know, another good one that Justin, you do all the time that I know Sal, you talk about, about after Justin, you know, uh, got you doing it just the overhead carries. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. You know, doing something like that before you start. I, I was just talking to my mm -hmm. brother-in-law yesterday about this because he's, you know, he's, oh man, I always got shoulder issues before I bench press. And I was telling him, I was like, dude, get some kettlebells, you know, and I was showing him, you know, get yourself in the right posture all the way above your head, pack the shoulder, stabilize there, tighten the core and walk with all your joints stacked and just, and just stabilize and hold. You're going to wake up all those muscles that are supporting that, that shoulder. And then when you go into bench, watch how much, cause you don't lose that energy. Whereas mm -hmm. if you don't, you go right into bench pressing and a lot of people think, oh, I'll just warm up by doing more benches. Well, that's great. You're warming up and getting some blood flow going, but you're not really reinforcing the stability in that joint the same way as you are if you're doing something like No, the rotator. stability of the shoulder joint has to match the strength. Otherwise, you're going to hurt yourself or the risk of injury is quite high. And again, the body senses this. In fact, uh, you know, there, there's been studies that have been done on this where people will try to exert max force and uh, and and then they'll have, there'll be some kind of an emergency and you'll see them exert even more force than that because mm -hmm. their body overrides yeah. the you know it's like it's like the story of the mom you know moving the car right. lifting the car to save their kid and later they realize they like ripped their muscle off the bone correct like your, your body won't let you and and there's also just a, a logical component like imagine if you're pushing a heavy cart with a stick but the stick has got like it's like half of the stick is a spring like it's you're not gonna be able to push it very far because you can't push the the force all the way through mm -hmm. it would be much more effective if the stick was you know strong stable and rigid oh. and rigid yeah. now i can push the cart uh, with a lot more force so mm -hmm. strengthening your just the muscles around the the shoulder joint that stabilize it the scapula so this is the, there's other parts of the shoulder joint right you have the shoulder the, the humerus but you also have the scapula that needs to be very stable and strong as well mm -hmm. this is where some people have issues with like winging you see this when they bench press and their shoulder blade will pop out and that could be an issue with maybe their serratus uh, muscle or anterior the, it's just all shoulder stability issues and this was one of my favorite things to do whenever i would get a lifter who hired me somebody who's already worked out and i'd say to them you know, I'd watch them bench and say, I bet I could add 10 pounds to your bench press in, you know, the next three weeks, which they'd be like, I, I dare you. Let me see what you can do. I'd, yeah. I'd work on their shoulder mobility and stability and boom, there goes another 10 pounds on the bench press. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I made that big of this a This is why the suspension trainer W's are my favorite because you get, you with the way the W works is you're kind of like, it's kind of a, a row mm -hmm. With it, an external rotation. By the way, the I want to I want to just caution everybody. Yeah. If you do that, yeah. start very easy because it's a, it's oh, a yeah. it's a very difficult exercise. It looks easy, but it's not. Especially when you get to the top. Well, what's of it. great about that is you can kind of walk close to the anchor for right. more intensity yes. and back. Yes. And, you know, for less. So it's it's very manageable that yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and the idea is is to get uh, controlled in it, not see how how hard you can make it. Right. It's Thank really, you. Yeah, yeah. Stabilization exercises are like that. Yeah. It's not like a, you're maxing out. Yeah. You're just I'm trying not, to get good at. Yeah. It. Exactly. 
exactly. I, I I'll always. I mean, I'm I'm doing 15 reps, slow, controlled, yes. pausing at the end, like that. I mean, you're just you're trying to wake all of that up, and then I'll go right to that. So I'll do that for like two sets, right? I'll do two sets of 15 of that, and then I'll go right into deep push-ups on the suspension trainer. So I'll go into, and that really just kind of solidifies it. Yeah. And again, not going hard. I'm not trying to make it the hardest push-up ever. It's a real basic angle. All I'm doing, though, is taking it through its full range of motion <laughs> right after I woke up those shoulders, stabilized it, a little instability on the suspension trainer, then go over to a barbell press. Oh, I feel so good. Yeah, that's excellent. That. We, we, we still have uh, suspension trainers. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, was yeah. It, was it mindpumpstore.com? Mm -hmm. Some people get those. All right, now let's talk about the, the technique. Let's get down to the technique of the bench press because – it is a very technical lift. It's actually one of the more uh, technical lifts uh, that you can do. Um, it's not just pushing up a bar off your chest. So the first thing uh, that's important is to have an arch in your in your low back. You want your hips on the bench, but you so your butt is on the bench, but you want an arch in your low back so you can almost put your arm underneath it. Now, in extreme cases, powerlifters will exaggerate the shit out of this. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about these extreme exaggerations. But you definitely want to have an arch in your back because what it does is it allows you to pull the shoulders blades back and anchor your upper back on the bench to provide a nice stable base for that bench press. You don't want a flat back. A flat back can cause the shoulders to roll forward um, and it can cause problems with the shoulders. You also have to talk about why that's not dangerous for a bench press where we know that's dangerous when you talk yeah. about other exercises, right? You're talking about vertical forces versus horizontal forces. And right. So when you put yourself in that position, the horizontal forces of the load is going to go direct right there towards the chest and then the extension of the arms. Uh, so really like the lower half of your body, you have to be concerned with stabilizing and generating that anchoring uh, effect. Yeah, no, the, the, the weight is anchored and up on your upper back. So my, my low back can be arched, but I'm not putting weight on my low back. The, right. the weight is on my upper back that's supporting. So you might have that strong arch. It also lifts the chest and allows you to really activate the chest more as well. Because if you roll the shoulders forward, you're going to find that you're going to just feel it more in your front delts and maybe even cause problems with your bicep tendon. In fact, sometimes people will feel pain in the front of their shoulder and be like, oh, my shoulder hurt. It's the bicep tendon that's inflamed from oftentimes poor uh, poor technique. Here's another one. Um, activate your lats. I remember when I first heard this, I'm like, what? Like, why would I want to activate my lats? I'm trying to push the weight away. This is a chest exercise. Yeah, not bring it in. <laughs> but then I remember when I first tried it. Um, you know, I, I gripped the bar real tight and then I activated my lats and kept them tight and then I dropped, bring the bar down and it was like, I felt way more stable oh, yeah. with the lift. Yeah, way more stable. You feel all this control that you didn't have. It was sort of like the weight was moving you versus you're, you know, allowing it to, to move. And I love that. I love uh, gripping the bar now. Yes. And then also like just trying to, you know, bend the, the bar apart. Like I'm, I'm literally trying to like bend the bar and that helps me to activate those lats more effectively. Yeah. It, staying tight is very important, which brings me to like the leg drive. I remember hearing people say this, like put your feet in the floor yes. and drive with your legs. I remember as a trainer thinking, well, that's stupid. What the hell are my legs what have to do? What do the do? legs have to do? Then? Yeah. I'm not squatting. Like I'm just bench pressing. And then I remember I tried it and I felt so much stronger and it, it, it didn't make sense to me and still I, yeah. in, until I learned about how the central nervous system fires. Mm -hmm. And really it's about this. Look, if, if, I act, if I'm trying to, to lift something and let's say I'm trying to do something with my right arm and I keep the rest of my body relaxed, my CNS is not going to fire yeah. as forcefully as when I tighten everything up. By the way, this is a natural thing. Like when you go open a tight jar or go do something that's very challenging, you'll find everything in your body tense up naturally, including your face. Mm -hmm. This is because the central nervous system fires with more force when it's activated uh, at uh, and mass versus when it's isolated. It's a much louder, more powerful signal when you get more muscles involved and that actually like helps you to generate more force overall. And so to get your legs involved is actually a massive advantage uh, in generating more force, which helps you then propel the weight away. This is a hard one for me. It took me a long time to figure this out. Like it, I still don't think I'm good at this. Like I think that it's a definitely a technique and a practice thing that – um, uh, for the, and I think a lot of it is because of how I, I bench pressed like a bodybuilder for so yeah. long where I wasn't thinking about my core and the rest of my body. And so here I am in the back half of my 
training career, still trying to piece this together. And I catch myself with bad habits. I catch myself, get under there. I go through like all my cues, rolling the shoulders back and get bending the bar, doing stuff. And then I forget the lower, forget body. the lower body. It's just, it's so hard for me to remember to do that where I find I'm better at it is when I go through the checks, I actually do that, that arch and then I brace the core and then I, and then I like, then I grip the floor. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's like a core, the core braces and I even like squeeze my glutes in that arch yes. position. Mm -hmm. And then that's, that's what kind of lights up. My yeah. You group. should feel your glutes should be turned on. Yeah. They should not be off and just relax. You should be pushing almost like you're going to push your butt up off the bench. You can't do that. Obviously, that makes you unstable, mm -hmm. but you want to feel that. And there's a couple different ways to do this. Now, the one, the, the, the way to teach it to most people is feet are flat on the floor mm -hmm. and you're driving with the legs, keeping everything tight while you're doing it. The other way to do it, which is a little more advanced, is you bring the feet back so that your, 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 your toes are in the floor. And that, this is how I like to do it because it keeps me really, really tight. Yeah. Much, it's more of an advanced way of lifting. You really and, get your quads to, to scream. Yeah, so I'm just, yeah. My, my feet are back here and I'm squeezing. Now, yeah. some uh, if you're a competitor, if you're going to compete in the bench press, some organizations don't allow you to do that. Some yeah. organizations require you to I keep like your feet like that too. to keep your feet flat. I didn't know that. Yeah. So, but but some of them allow you to pull the toes back. But th for me, when I bring the feet back like that, because my quads are tight tight anyway, it's like everything feels very tight. And then mm -hmm. when I drive, my body doesn't budge, but I'm driving. Everything feels real turned on, and of course, and then I can you know lift uh, more weight. All right, let's talk about advanced techniques. Right, advanced ways. Of getting yourself to to yeah. lift. Uh, How do we add in variable resistance? Yeah. Yeah. Chains, the bands, all the toys. Yeah, yeah. So the first one, this is the easiest one. Doesn't require any uh, additional equipment. Is to to focus on pausing your bench press repetition and folk and then strengthening your areas of weakness. For most people, the area of weakness is at the bottom. Uh, other people, it's at the top. But let's say it's at the bottom, right? Let's say when you you notice when you bench that the hardest part is that first five inches, right, off the bench. How can I get, but then after that, it gets much easier, right? How can I improve upon that? Well, one thing you can do is you can bench press, bring the bar down to your chest, stay tight, don't lose connection, hold it at your chest for, you know, three to five seconds and then pressing. That isometric in that portion of the rep will get you stronger in that portion of the repetition. Actually, I did this for so long that I made that weakness one of my strengths. Now it's my strength is at the bottom part. Well, this is another great way th to build in that frequency that we talked about, right? So this is how yeah. I would do something like this. I would have a day where, you know, I'm messing with, you know, isometric stuff and tempo stuff for a whole workout. Mm -hmm. So like I'll do a bench. Wait, this is something I just recently did. So I, one of the days, this last four or five days that we were, we hadn't seen each other, uh, I told you I did all benching and squatting, basically. Well, one, one of the days I was benching, I was going heavy. Another day was all tempo stuff, mm -hmm. super light. Like, I'm working with 135, which is really, really lightweight for bench press for me. But then I'm doing, like, the pausing at the bottom, or I'm doing, like, an mm -hmm. eight-second oh, negative. Yeah, really slow negative just tears yeah. me up. I love yeah, it. Yeah, real slow negative. Or I was doing, uh, I did an alternate incline dumbbell press where I come down, and then I actually don't lock out. I keep a slight bend, so my chest is at the, almost like the contracted position and it's stabilizing while the other one goes down and then I press up and I have to I'm working with 50 pound dumbbells 135 mm -hmm. so I'm not going to do a lot of damage like I did on the the previous workout where I was lifting like 215 for reps that's really going to do a lot of damage to me so this is how you build in the frequency I think is you use tools like these to be able to do another day of work but then you do light lighter work yeah, another advanced technique is just to it, to literally unrack a very heavy bench press hold it for about five to ten seconds and then rack it back up just that stabilizing at the right. top boy does that turn everything on especially if your lockout is where you have an issue where mm -hmm. you'll find that as your bench once you get past halfway you get kind of stuck Try just unracking a heavy weight and just holding it for five to ten seconds yeah. and doing that. It's helpful for a few to have sets. a spotter for those kinds of yes, things. Yes, that's a very yeah. that's why it's advanced. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, no, I I love doing that because it, too acclimating towards um, familiarizing yourself with heavier weight. I think is just an important thing to do if that's like your goal is really to start moving weight and getting stronger. I think it's it's important to also kind of feel your way up. And so there's you know there's another uh, fractional weight 
plates too is another kind of a technique where you can add in uh like one pound at a yeah, time yeah it's like you barely feel it um it's it's one of those things you just slowly uh you know gradually like add load but like in, in a very very small amount um it, it, it's definitely like one of those it's going to take a bit of time to get you through but a lot of times it helps you get past some plateaus where you got stuck yeah i've always wanted to try that i've always wanted to do where like i work out moderate intensity i would love to see how this works right moderate intensity so I'm not going to failure, but I'm going kind of hard. And then all I do is every week I add a total of one pound to the lift. So every single week, nonstop, moderate intensity, half a pound on each side, and just see what ends up happening in terms of my progress. I have a feeling that I'd probably progress pretty well mm -hmm. for a while before my body would start to- Have you, you done know, that plateau. before, Justin? I've never done that before. I've done it before, yeah. And, and it was great because I was in a gym where that was like, it was a lot of Olympic lifters and people that like had the fractional plates and like they'd even had magnets yeah. that they would put on to the side. And I never had thought about that, but it just, it makes- total logical sense uh and you really don't necessarily feel it right away but it's usually once you start building up the volume that's where you, you really start to yeah feel what's it what is it wasn't that fable or whatever where he carries the bull up the hill oh uh, right. my, it, milo it's yeah, the whole yeah. progressive uh, overload sort yeah. of yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Right? He, he lifts up a baby uh you know calf every single day until it grows up and of course he gets stronger right, yeah. right. that's a, that's the that's progressive overload right? right um bands have to be my favorite uh they, they feel the most smooth um, I love I just they're very very smooth. I can also do speed with bands, which you can't really do with a lot of other things. So yeah. some what I'll do is is and this is for power. Power definitely contributes to and I mean by when I say power, I mean the speed at which you lift. I would take let's say my max bench was three hundred pounds. I'd put maybe one hundred and thirty five pounds on, but then I'd put heavy bands on, mm -hmm. and then my goal is to lower the weight down to my chest, real controlled, and then push it up as fast as I could, almost like I'm trying to throw the weight out of my hands and just practice speed. So, and I'm not even going anywhere close to failure. I'm just like one or two of those. And man, I would notice a huge carryover in the speed of my heavy bench. Like my heavy bench would move faster because of that. Well, it's another great example, Tom, going back to the frequency topic, right? These, here's another tool that you use for yep. a great frequency day. Not going to do a lot of damage, right? Doing band work, speed work yeah. like that, where you're going really, really lightweight or doing just bands by themselves, like doing speed work. Uh, you're not going to do a lot of damage, but a great way to build frequency for this. I would throw in like even body uh, body weight stuff here or suspension trainer type work here too. I think that's an, yeah. an, an underrated tool for building totally. your bench, especially when we talk about building frequency. You don't want, if you build frequency and you lift your chest three days a week, you do not want it to be barbells and dumbbells every single lift or else you're going to end up probably overtraining. Well, what I love about the, the suspension trainer, like doing just like some presses and, and uh, you know, putting more intensity on that uh, right away, just holding yourself in yeah. place in that plank position really exposes any little weakness and in, in instability. Uh, it sh it's glaring at that point and to it. And ev every incremental uh, angle of, of the way down to and then the way up, um, it's, it's a struggle. And so it's it's a very valuable uh, exercise then that applies and translates nicely to yeah well, you know one thing i like to do with the for speed with the suspension trainer and I, I won't set this very low because we're looking for speed is i'll do the deep push up right go all the way down the bottom and then from there and again this is an advanced technique so you have to have good stability my goal is to press myself up to a standing position with 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 speed right so i'm focusing on speed with this really nice range of motion and i do notice a good carryover um one time and i haven't done this in a long time I used a device that hooked on the barbell, so you could put plates on it, and when you lower the weight, the device hits the floor, unhooks from the bench, and then you uh, lift. Uh, so you like overload I've the negative, mm -hmm. yeah. which is actually quite interesting. It's actually a very interesting feeling to do a heavy negative than with a normal. With a, well, I mean, that's it would be awesome, right? If you don't have a spotter, right? Because that's yeah. what you, I remember as a kid. We used to we used to love negatives. We used to love putting when back when I couldn't even bench two twenty five, throwing three fifteen on the bar, and having, having your friends help you. Yeah, having your friends, you know help you down like that there's some there's some tremendous value to that i but just boy does it wreck you, you it does that's so i mean i'm careful with teaching techniques like that because one i think we ordered this correctly right with the posture being your number one thing two frequency man i cannot stress that that will be the biggest game changer for most people most people are not training their chest three days a week just doing that but if you do that 
you can't have heavy bench and uh, dumbbell day and then followed by heavy negatives the next day in the no, gym. Oh no. You'll just trash your chest and you won't give it you you won't give it the recovery that it needs and so, you know, that uh, heavy negatives would replace like a, a you know, heavy bench press day for yeah. me. Now, chains is another easy way to do this kind of progressive resistance. You could buy these at your hardware store and essentially what you're doing is you're hanging the chain off the bar as you lower the weight the chain hits the ground, thus making the weight lighter. So the weight is heaviest at the top, lightest at the bottom, which kind of matches your typical strength curve when you bench, right? Because you you're got, weakest at the bottom, strongest at the top. You got to get a long enough chain uh, to pull it off. Right? Yeah, because you want it to, to coil down on the ground as you're as you're coming down. So that way, yeah, you do lose some weight, and then you gain weight as you can then press uh, in your strongest part of the, the strength curve. Yeah, and one thing you can also do with the chain is you hang the chain, and at the bottom, you put a lot of chain so that the top, it's real heavy, and as soon as you go down, it gets much lighter because mm -hmm. most of the weight is on the bottom uh, of the chain. But again, that progressive resistance. And you know, it's funny, this this was, again, this was, I think the Soviets were the ones to really figure this out. Power lifters started doing this kind of stuff. And what I love now is you're now starting to see like bodybuilders and stuff utilizing progressive resistance because it's not just going to make you stronger. It makes you build. Are you um, sure they're not just putting on their uh, chest for pictures? Yeah, no. Yeah. no. <laughs> or they'll attach it to machines, which drives me crazy. Yeah. I got some of those photos. Yeah. Well, there you go. Look, I if, do too. <laughs> <laughs> Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our guides and books. Totally free. Lots of great information. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So you can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. Everything you do as a trainer is selling. Now, you might not be selling for money always. You might not be selling products always or even services always, but you're constantly selling ideas. In fact, here you are talking to Mrs. Johnson, who has never exercised cons 